um, want to first thank the organization, organization FUF. Um, thank you, FUF, for having me. <laughs> um, and AJ for uh, having a vision to organize, put together an organization such as this. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak in front of uh, a group such as this. Again, uh, my name is Jeff Baker, president of the Committee for a Better Chicago, member of the Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression, um, and a firm, firm believer in organizations working together. Uh, when AJ first asked me to uh, keynote, give the keynote speech, um, this being my first keynote speech, I initially uh, rebuffed his request. Um, I looked up the word keynote, and the word keynote means to basically set the stage, to set the tone of an entire event. Now, AJ, called me his friend up until this point, and I thought that was quite an amount of pressure to put on somebody you call your friend. So I, I began to give uh, AJ my reverse resume. I told him how uh, I was not the right person for this job, um, how there were many, many, many people that I knew that would be better as a keynote speaker. I told him how you know, the things that I did in college, he didn't care. He basically told me, okay, that's all fine and good. If you want to be a punk, I'll go find a man to do it. <laughs> in so many words. So after, after that insult, I uh, made a few calls. I called him back. I tried to track him down and I begged him to be the keynote speaker. So here I am today. So once again, thank you. Thank you for having me. Like I said, I was obsessed with words. And in doing my research about the organization, I read something. I'm not sure if this was a, a statement of AJ's or the organization as a whole. But it mentioned that the organization's purpose, one of the organization's purpose, was to bring community to community organizations. And in looking up that word, community, we find that the root word is commune. Now commune, I'm going to read you the actual uh, definition. Commune interchange of ideas or sentiments to converse or talk together usually with profound intensity. So this statement that was made, bringing community to community organizations, let's talk about the word community. A group sharing common characteristics or interests and perceived or perceiving itself as distinct in some way from the larger society in which it exists. So what I found after reading those two definitions is that bringing community to community organizations is definitely necessary. But community is a noun. It can be a community without actually doing anything except being. We are a community of community organizations. But what we want to do is to bring commune to community organizations. We have to interact. We have to share ideas. We have to share resources. We have to share thoughts. And we have to share our accomplishments. And currently, there's not a whole lot of that going on. So what we have to do is somehow figure out a way, first of all, I guess we should ask ourselves, 
Why should we bring commune to community organizations? Well, the uh, first thing that occurs to me is because it's part of the word, that would make sense to bring commune to community organizations. But other than that, numbers. As community organizations, we are looking to empower members of the community. We are looking to help them find their way out of oppression or fight their way through, through oppression. In doing so, we are fighting a system, a system that is very powerful, a system that has numbers. Numbers are very important in a capitalistic society, whether it be numbers of money or numbers of people. We are fighting a system that has a great amount of money, a great amount of power, and quite often a great amount of people. And if we are fighting this system individually without communing with other like-minded individuals, we are almost assured a defeat. If we are trying to fight this system without strategy, developing a strategy along with other like-minded individuals, or better yet, along with the community that we find ourselves a part of, which is the community organizing community, we are likely to be dealt a very, very, very deadly blow. So that's one of the reasons. Sharing resources. As small community organizations, um, looking to help oppressed communities, we are likely to have very little resources. And working with other organizations empowers us. It saves us money, it saves us time. Knowing what a similar organization on the north side is doing and not uh, what is uh, trying to reinvent the wheel or duplicating those efforts makes us more powerful, makes us uh, more likely to reach our audience and help those that we are looking to help. Aaron Schwartz, one of the namesakes of um, one of the awards being given today, reminds us that this powerful uh, system will demonize, persecute, and prosecute as they did Aaron Schwartz until he felt so much pressure that he took his own life. We, as a community of community organizations, have to support one another because the pressure can become too much for us to bear alone. How can you teach an organization, or better yet, pardon me, how can you teach organization to an oppressed people when you cannot even organize your community of community organizations? Let me say that again, let me say it a little bit slower. How can we, as community organizations, attempt or accomplish organizing oppressed people when we cannot even organize our community of community organizations? How can we teach something that we cannot even practice? There is a definite need for us to talk, interchange ideas with profound intensity. So, why aren't we community? What are the barriers? I came up with three main barriers. Um, monetary gain. There's a great competition going on amongst community organizations. There's this competition that makes it uh, not all that intelligent or not all that smart for me to share my profound idea 
with another community organization fighting for the same carrot or prize, monetary gain. Organizational recognition is another reason. If I'm working with Operation Push and my little organization, the Committee for a Better Chicago, or FUF, <laughs> Operation Push will drown me out. Now, what happens to the name Committee for a Better Chicago, Alliance Against Racist Political Repression, or FUF, if I'm working with Push and they overshadow it? We fear that. There are a lot of organizations that fear that, and therefore rebuff working with other organizations. And then there's this third one, personal recognition. I call it ego. There are a lot of organizations, or many of individuals, that lead organizations for their own personal uh, ego. They want to be seen. They want the recognition, and they want it to themselves. So it's not to their benefit to bring another powerful leader alongside in this fight, somebody that may get that spotlight, that's ego. So we have monetary gain, we have organizational recognition, and we have personal recognition or ego, which leads us to how do we overcome these barriers? How do we get to community? Let's start there. Um, I guess uh, we get there by developing organizations like this one. And I want to thank AJ again for having the thought to create an organization like this with a mission, just a small part, part of the mission. Focus on building community and working with other organizations and individuals to do so. Basically stating, in our mission, that we will reach out to other organizations to work in concert. In their mission, if we can get other organizations across the city of Chicago to make that a part of their mission, to reach out to other organizations, we will be all the better for it, in my opinion. Collaboration must be in our missions. We must become and teach economic self-sufficiency. Perhaps if we can become economically self-sufficient, uh, organizations run a little bit more like businesses then we don't have to fight one another for grant money. Then you don't have to be my competitor. We can work together. If I'm not threatened by your popularity or your success, why wouldn't I commune with you? How do we overcome the barrier created by fear of autonomy? or organizational recognition. I say we overcome that. I can work with push. I have to be strategic in my marketing. I have to make sure that I do as much outreach, that I touch as many people, or attempt to, as push is touched, and we can work together. I have to make sure that the people that work with my organization know that we are out here making a difference and working with Bush. We have to be strategic in getting our name out so that other organizations are better yet, so that people know that we're out here doing the work and they want to join us. Yes, we're gonna be in somewhat of a shadow working with bigger and larger organizations, but we have to do our work to make ourselves seen, heard, and to get to the bottom line, or better yet, the goal. Last but not least, how do we overcome the barriers created by a need for personal recognition. Well, if you want personal recognition, I guess you can go about it the same way that you achieve the goal of getting organizational recognition. Marketing. You have to reach out to people. 
You have to be seen, you have to be heard, you have to be on the social networks, you have to be out in the street. But honestly, in my opinion, if your persona is growing faster than your results, then we, as a community of community organizers, we must purge you from the community. We have to purge those egomaniacs from the community. I believe that they are cancerous for the community. And until we decide that that is a necessary, a necessary action, then they will continue to carry this community in the wrong direction. So, in closing, are we ready to commune? You can talk back. Yeah. Are we ready to commune with one another? Are we ready to purge? Yep. No. I think we better be. Selflessness, fearlessness, and economic self-sufficiency are three of the keys that I think will help push us towards better commune and better community. Thank you for your time and your attention. Hey guys, hey, how's everyone doing today? Right. Thank you um, for coming out, this means a lot to me. Um, this has been planned for a little over two months for me doing all this. Um, as you'll read in the program, this is the Foundation for United Front, and what I, what the start back in Springfield when I lived down there, and kind of a little bit of birth from the Occupy Springfield when I was involved with them down there, and I, for most of you have known me in various capacities, and I really wanted to start an organization where we needed to talk to each other, we needed to share resources, and we needed to fight on the same page. And I think all of us can agree we were a little bit left-leaning <clears throat> to one degree or another. And so um, that's what we do in Foundation Night Front. You know, we provide programming such as the Public Sphere program where we talk about societal issues and political issues through forums, panels, maybe book movie nights, book nights. We have, we're starting with Democracy University where we're going to train activists, community organizers, campaigners, and not-for-profit leaders to become effective leaders in their own right. Um, and then, of course, uh, we have the Speaking Freely Speaker series where we bring in people to talk about political and activist issues. Um, that, that ranges right from Bill Ayers, Bobby Seale, the Gorilla Girls, um, we talk about these people because, you know, they're the ones who are in the forefront and some of us are still learning, um, like myself. So, without further ado, um, I'm going to be presenting the three awards, the Volvo Award, the Aaron Schwartz Award, and the Silas Sluga Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, the one the people who are going to present here could not make it, and so I'm just going to fill in that place here um, for the moment. So. So right now we're going to start with the Volvo Award. Trinity's going to help me out here. <laughs> um, the Volvo Award. This award is, going to, is given out to individuals and organizations that have provided events that shows their passion on what they're fighting for. As well as sometimes we go, these events are fun, some of these are very serious. And the, all of these uh, Every, all the criteria for the Volvo Award, um, Aaron Schwartz Award, the Lifetime Achievement, as well as the Cole Award itself. Um, yeah, some people have asked me what the criteria is. Like, yeah, I know most of these people. And I went down the list of this. And this is the first year we'll have another one. So it's going to be a whole list of other people. So it's not just it. So, um, so the criteria is pretty much, you know, observations that I have made, you know, conversations I have with people. and what fits best for this year, the next year we're going to have a whole set of other people because we need to celebrate all of us together, you know, this is not a one-time thing. We will keep, continue on the celebration. So the first uh, recipient, I'll 
and there's some people who won't be here. Um, the first recipient is the the Left Wing School with Andy and Josh Luker. Um, left Wing School um, is based down in the Metro East area, down in St. Louis. Um, Josh and Andy Luker, as well as our organizers, who have created the Left Wing School. It essentially, there's various workshops that people learn about, whether it be about fracking, whether it be what the IWW is doing, uh, what the Green Party is doing, what the Socialist and Communist parties are doing, um, how are we going to fight racism, classism, stuff like that. And presenters from across Missouri and Illinois come to this and learn from each other about this. And last year was held at Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville, and the year before that was at um, uh, the labor union down there um, in Missouri. So, and Josh and Nanny can't be here, but they will have their award. Um, the next person is Josh Bailey. Josh Bailey is a radio personality. He has a radio station called um, Prairie Sonder, um, and there's been a, round, a lot of rallies when it comes to uh, free rally manning. You know, we all had these rallies, but Josh took it a next step further. We had music for Manny. It was down in Douglas Park in Springfield. It was a day-long event. Um, the lower picture, the lower, if you're looking at the lower left picture, Greg Bishop has his um, Bishop on the Air that with the ABC affiliate radio station that he was out there and live streamed it down there all day. Um, there were speakers. Um, we had um, musicians such as Josie Louder. Um, we had JJ and all them rapping down there. We had Dr. Richard Gilmopowski, who's on that picture as well, who was talking about, you know, why this is a shameful thing that the government is torturing this person who all he did was give information that all we need to know for accountability and transparency purposes. And uh, to my understanding, Justice is going to do this again next year. But um, this was a huge event, and it was an awesome thing that I, I heard about and witnessed and everything. And uh, we need to have more events like this, not just rallies, but we also need to have, you know, music for Manning, maybe music for Snowden and other people that we need to have because these are the people that we need to put up to a pestle to a degree because they need it. Um, Next up is Katie Brown, Bruce Barger, who, who also can't be here down, down in Kentucky, um, Osborne, Kentucky. The second they had the second year this year is the Occusoc. First year they had it. Um, it was successful. It was in the, Indiana last year. Again, it was in southern Indiana. Think of Woodstock. That's all I need to think about. <laughs> think of Woodstock. And that was Katie's idea is like, you know, how can I have Woodstock but have an Occustock? And that was the original idea. Originally was to have occupiers come, camp out, mm -hmm. listen to music, and talk to each other. You know, this festival of music and just having fun. <clears throat> this past year, I, she asked me to come down and speak at, down there in Occustock. Um, same thing, but the, the purpose was it was a canned food drive too. Raised almost 500 pounds of food for the Tri-State Food Bank, the Tri-State that covers Illinois, Indiana, and Kentucky. That was the donation, that was the admission to get in there. There was a monetary amount, but food was the first and foremost thing. They could care less about money as long as you came and speak. Um, people like Neil and Spencer and all them came down to talk about things like legalizing marijuana. We also have solar panels down there. We're talking about other people that we all know and love also networking at the same time for three days outside in the heat in southern Indiana. Um, it was a beautiful thing. So uh, it's Katie and, Katie and Bruce for on your side. Um, Next up, and I think Laura, Laura is here with uh, Fly. If she can come up.
Fly is a, a program of STOP, um, which is located here in the south side. Um, <clears throat> what Fly did, for those of you who don't know, um, what they did was here at the University of Chicago, this trauma center, and it was limiting on how young one needs to be in the trauma center. And it's the only trauma center here in the south side. The next one closest is like north side, up by Northwestern. And then one downtown is one complete south suburbs. This is the only one, but they limited how young you had to be. So they went out mm. in protest, and they made a ruckus out of it. So much so, the university police had to put up plastic barricades, not the real ones, the plastic barricades, in order for them not to continue their fight. So we feel that Fly this year would, should be honored for what they've done, because we still need Justice needs to stop. And I want to thank Cerise for being the liaison to the victims' families, because I know that has to be heart wrenching all by itself. So I, we thank you as well as the Alliance for your work. Next up is the Eric Schwartz Young Youth and Young Adult Award. We, I named the Eric Schwartz Award because I was inspired by Aaron um, long before his um, what he did with Harvard um, academic journals and all that when he got the information. Um, as a geek, um, RSSPs, that's that guy. He made it. I believe at 15, 14 or 15. So even as a, a nerd and a geek, that was impressive about what he's done to advance information to be put out there and standing up for that right. That was just inspiring all by itself. And it's shameful that he had to do what he had to do, his only way out. Which is why we need to stop that, what the government's doing to people like Aaron, because we need more Aaron Schwartz's. We need more youth to stand up. Um, I remember my days, um, late 90s, um, 2000s, like in college and all that, 
we thought it was cool that we stood up to the administration, you know, of looking up to the people of the 60s and 70s, what they'd done. We thought that was cool, but we sat in, you know, we gave them nicknames and everything, and we felt, you know, to honor those youth and the young adults, because these are the people who are starting to trailblaze and also providing us information on what we need to do as community organizers and activists. So uh, without further ado, the first person up who is not, who's not here with us um, from Indiana, Spencer Tracy. I met Spencer at AccuSock actually. He just started, it's almost nearly six months now, the Indiana Mar Miracle Marijuana Advocates Organization. All he does is goes around to clinics and educates people going into the clinics that this is an alternative. This does work. There are studies out there. These marijuana does work. And he educates clinicians and physicians that we need to promote this more and make it legal. And Illinois is the 20th state to legalize it. So, so with that, I was, again, inspired on what Spencer was doing because he, this is his full-time job. And when I heard that, I mean, I know this is my full-time job as an activist community writer, but he, I, if I remember right, he left a job to do this with their newborn child now to this earth. This is what their family does. This is a family effort, and they continue on fighting in Indiana. And I know Norm, Indiana Normal had an event where they were there. It doesn't matter if it was Fort Wayne, Indiana, or down in Crawfield, Indiana. Spencer and Samuel will be there, and we thank them for that. <laughs> Next person up, it's Andrew Woolbright. Uh, Andrew Wilbright, some of us met him down in Springfield. He started an um, artist co-op called The Pharmacy. It's this uh, building there, and you can still see remnants of the word pharmacy on there. It's kind of, it's, if, you're, if you're from Springfield, for those of you who've been to Springfield, you're like, what's the pharmacy? You walk in, and it's like this nice <laughs> art gallery of artists and everything, and then it's much more than that. It's an activist incubator as well. A lot of us from Occupy Springfield met there. We had teachings there. We collaborated there. We, all of us had means there. Other people had means there. But Andrew also took it a step further. He provides housing for art students for the University of Illinois in Springfield. He got co house co-ops around that block. He works with the University of Illinois Springfield, or he did, to have the students come there, work there, live there, to bridge Springfield and campus together because for those of you who don't know Springfield that well, university is on the other side of town, away from the city, and then there's downtown. He bridged the two because that's what needed to happen in the art community. And we love Andrew for that. Um, he's now working on his MFA at the Rhode Island School of Design in Rhode Island. And we're hoping he comes back because um, we need more people like him in Springfield and hopefully starts one in Rhode Island. So, again, we thank Andrew for what he does for that. <laughs> I know Mike's here. Yeah. Mike's here. Hey, come on, Mike. <laughs> this is the Mike Cox person. <laughs> Mike is the founder and organizer for Multiculti. Um, it was by someone accident came into his space because of Tom Tresser because there was an event that was going to be there. I came to it and I came to the space and I'm like, what is this space? Multiculti is a multi-purpose space in downtown Springfield in the southern end of Wicker Park neighborhood. Chicago. Wow. Wow. In Chicago, excuse me. Senior moment. Thank you, Joe. 
<laughs> multi like I said, multicultural is a multi-purpose space. It's not only a place where activists and organizers get to meet. They also hold fundraisers. You can also have music events. There's jazz nights and at Multiculti. I believe every once in a while there's like other musicians and other rappers can go up there. Elmoy Normal is headquarters there. Um, you know, the Foundation I Front works out of there. Other people work out of there. Um, everyone that we know in Chicago goes to Multiculti. So much so the Chicago Reader voted them the best underground venue in Chicago. We also are going to honor them and Mike for what you're doing, and it's awesome. I'm glad you have it. I hope it stays at the location. If not, hopefully, there's more multicultures in Chicago. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Next person up is Nebula Lee. Nebula is another younger person who just graduated from law school. Uh, also fights on the LGBTIQ front as well as, as for the Asian Pacific front as well. And, this, and I gotta be honest, this is the first time I met Nebula at a Occupy the South Side meeting. When Bush and Marissa, I'm like, oh, you gotta meet Nebula, you gotta meet Nebula. I'm like, who's Nebula? She comes in and um, it, she's very charismatic. When I first met her, she's very charismatic, very heartwarming, um, very intelligent as well. And just to listen to her, because I personally don't know much about um, struggles in the Asian community as well then I should, but she gave me an education <laughs> on what goes on. And because of that, um, I was just astonished at what she's, she's done and everything. And so uh, she too is another inspiration and why I feel that she deserves the Aaron Schwartz Award. So, Nebula Lee. Thank you. Next person, Wes King. Wes King is the current um, executive director for the Illinois Stewardship Alliance. Um, for those of you who are in the food justice fight, you might have met Wes at one point or another. He's also has done a lot of stuff on the national front, policy-wise. Um, the Farm Bill is currently in Congress. He's been working on that as well. As well as certain other food laws in Illinois to continue to have community gardens, to continue to have no GMOs in our product and everything. Um, again, another person who is inspirational and for what he's done now in Springfield, but in Illinois and for what he's done here nationally. Um, another inspiration, people, West King. <laughs> Last one, and I know you're <laughs> here. Chris Blackenhorn. <laughs> I'm like, who's this cat with a fro way bigger beard. and a way bigger beard? And I'm like, who is this guy? Chris is one of the founders for the Radical Student Union. It's a student organization in Springfield. And I figure, okay, it has to be another student organization like most. No, no hierarchy. They want to help the community in Springfield. It's because of the Radical Student Union, who also was a driving force, of Occupy Springfield, so much so, uh, I feel under your leadership, dropping that banner in the State House. <coughs> Vote for me, not green. <laughs> and ever since, I'm like, all right. Um, and Chris is, works with me with the Foundation Night Front as well. And uh, this is also another person I lean on when it comes to not only philosophical. Things when I'm in question, but also someone um, I know I can rely on and all that. And I know, and I'm saying this for real, uh, inspiration, 
because it's like, wow, I mean, if I was a little bit younger, I wouldn't commit what Chris is doing. So Chris, thank you and all that. Silas Luga Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, for those, um, excuse me. For, uh, sorry. They met, 
they were talking, they get to know each other, hearts came and glazed and everything. And then all of a sudden, I think it was Silic because you look familiar. Mike looks familiar. And they found out that they both found each other in Florida when they crossed paths. And from that moment on, they continued to fight the same fight. They help other people. They show us young people what we need to do. And for that, thank you, Silic. Thank you. I have, Mike. I have to put a little bit in context. Yes, please. <laughs> That is the first time that I met Scylla. She did not want to cross the picket line. <laughs> she came out of the taxi cab going, oh my God, I have never crossed a picket line in my life. I would never cross a picket line in my life. My father was a coal miner. My grandfather was a coal miner. I am not going to cross a picket line. But my conference is here. I do, what do I do? What's my choice? So I granted her dispensation <laughs> and said, I can go inside the hotel, but You've got to complain, you've got to demand that the room be calmed, you've got to, you know, make yourself a boil on the boss's butt. And she did. Every day at lunchtime, she would come out, sometimes with her co-workers and co-conference attendees, and walk the picket line. So, I, yeah, I just want to clear her reputation that she was not a willing uh, picket line crosser, but that it, it, it is true that uh, when we met, it's like, oh my God.
Frank Chapman. Frank Chandler is a field organizer for the Chicago Lions against racist political repression. And um, this is, went to a meeting that um, Rosa Mike Bush again asked me to come along to. Um, something about the Civilian Police Accountability Council that we need Democratic elected board so for police killers and all this. I'm like, what? Okay, I'll, I'll go to this. And then there's Frank Chapman at the other end of this table. And, uh, Again, I mean, just right off the bat, I'm like, who is this guy? And, you know, again, civil rights activist, fought and fight for workers' rights, hearing stories on how he went to my other town, lived in Clinton, Iowa, but he went there about civil rights, and he hitchhiked from Clinton, Iowa, back to Chicago, and then went down to St. Louis for that same struggle to fight with the union workers and all that. And now he's here in Chicago fighting for stop police crimes, torturing people here in Chicago, mm. as well as keep on that same message that, you know, we are fighting for social justice. Mm. Even though using the same methods he had, they still apply today. And because of that, like, you know, these are something that, you know, you can't reinvent the will, yes, but this is something that was just, again, at all, and every time I sat in a meeting or even talked to him or he says, hey, AJ, can you come down and uh, do a little phone banking or something, like, sure, and then get to talk to him. I go, I go, like, wow, you guys have a lot of stories and all that. So, again, thank you, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Finley Campbell. Church. And uh, as I came to First Unitarian Church, uh, you know, you do the whole meet and greet social hour and uh, came across Finley. Um, I've, I know other people that have met Finley have talked about Finley. And uh, at, it was, I forgot what meeting it was at, but he said something that perked my ears and I want to know more about who this Finley Campbell is. Again, a breadth of history here. Ran for governor of Indiana. <clears throat> Went all the way from Fort Wayne, Indiana, down to Crossville, Indiana, um, to talk about, you know, you need an alternative to what we have, of the established parties that we have, as well as fighting the civil rights movement and knowing people, like, knowing people like Jesse <laughs> and Sharpton as well as knowing people like Chomsky. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> um, and, I, and, I can, and, I, and I say this as a, as a friend, uh, you're an awesome mentor. Um, invites me to his place just to talk and everything. And I'm now learning more things from this gentleman right here. And thank you for that. And that's why I felt you need the recognition of that. George Martin, can you please come down, sir? In a couple of weeks, on the 28th specifically, we're going to be um, celebrating the anniversary of Dr. King, and I have a dream speech. It was a very memorial, momentous day for all of some of us who watch it live, we just get to hear about it. <clears throat> this gentleman right here stood 10, 15 feet from King when he gave I Dream a speech. Oh, wow. I, this man right here. George Martin was on the Peace and Social Justice Front, has traveled all across the country to advocate for peace advocate for social justice and civil rights. Even more so uh, went to Ghana where they have honored him, tribe down there, 
Neagente is his honorary title. And when I, when I met George in Detroit at the U.S. Social Forum there, um, he was even at the National Green Party meeting. Um, people, somebody, you gotta meet George Martin, gave me George Martin. I'm like, okay. He stood up. We do this thing called the action, which George only does. When George speaks, you listen. Very charismatic. Uh, and when, anytime I have a question about facilitation or even questions about what needs to happen, you know, I turn to George and all that. George will provide the answers. And I'm glad that I've met you and thank you for what you do. And please keep on fighting my fight, bro. Chicago. I was watching Andy Thayer do his television show, and 
the person on his show that day happened to be Kathy Kelly. Mm -hmm. And what he happened to be talking about that day was Afghanistan. And he said to the people, if we want justice for ourselves, we have to care about justice for other people too. And today what we're talking about is Afghanistan. So, folks, this is what we're going to talk about. Um, and I think everybody who is being recognized, these seven activists, all embody that. And I can prove it because I've run into them in all kinds of events uh, and, and protests in Chicago. So here's the way I'd like to do this. Um, AJ has provided me with tremendous detailed litany of all the achievements of these people. You all know them as well as I do. I'm tempted to go on at great length about all these great stories about them. And I know that each of them has something special to say about what they're doing right now because they're organizers and they care about what they're doing. So what I'm going to suggest that we do is I'm going to ask each person to come up. I will have a few brief remarks and then ask them to tell you just a, a little bit right now what's happening because these are not Lifetime Achievement Awards. You are not done yet. You got to keep working. All right? All right. So uh, our first one, and Arissa will help me find the awards. The first one is Dr. Laura Chamberlain. Anybody who is involved in activism in Chicago, and particularly anybody who's involved in environmental activism in Chicago, knows Dr. Laura. She is a force of nature. I got to know her really well uh, a little earlier this year. We were working on a um, conference about the climate crisis. And in working with her, I saw something about her that I want to lift up and um, you know there's there's something special about each of these people and I, I just want to take a moment to, to delve into that. Dr. Laura expresses a kind of expertise that is vital to movement and particularly in the environmental field we can't do what we need to do without actually being deep 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 into the facts. I had her speaking one evening or one afternoon when we did this a screening about fracking. And I said, okay, I need you to give us an introduction, 12 minutes, everything about fracking. And it was amazing. It was just, it just blew my mind. So um, Dr. Laura is uh, uh, our first awardee tonight. Thank you very much. And will you tell us what's the current state of what's happening? Come yeah, on up, exactly. just step up here. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I want to um, congratulate the entire uh, fracking movement here in Illinois. We, we made great strides this year, and so I'd like to honor everybody in this room who made a call, who sent an email, who petitioned their Illinois reps and senators, who went to a rally. Can you just raise your hands? Yay! Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's truly a movement. So, um, fracking, we didn't stop fracking. I'm so sorry. We didn't get the moratorium. Fracking is coming to Illinois. And I don't know if you're going to be able to see this map, but um, this is a map of Illinois. I, I joke with you. Yeah. Can you hold it for me, Simon? Mm -hmm. Sorry, you didn't second. come prepared. No problem. So um, <laughs> this is a map of Illinois, and all of this yellow area down in the south, including the Shawnee National Forest, and all of this area in central Illinois are targeted for fracking. This is a pipeline that they're building, along with the Tar Sands pipeline that is there already. This is starved rock that's getting buffeted now by what we hear is 70 more sand companies that want to come into this very small area and poison the air with silica for all the residents. So you can see that it is going to devastate our state. People do not understand about the scope of fracking. We think there'll be somewhere of like this, uh, somewhere around 10,000 wells in this area, okay? So we have not stopped. They, have met, they may have passed a regulatory bill and the green light might be going on for fracking, but we are not gonna stop. In the back, there's some flyers, um, especially if you're, if you're kind of a geek kind, like I am, uh, there's folded flyers about the radioactivity and the seismic issues around this fracking. Please join the movement. 
please sign up to Frag Free. We'll send you emails about the next protest, the next time we're in the Illinois Reps and Senators office, the next time we go to the governor's office. We really must stop fracking. We have to get a ban, and we are just moving ahead for that. Thank you so much. Our next honoree is Marissa Brown. Marissa, will you come on up here? And I'm just going to say briefly, my experience has been so tremendous with Marissa. Uh, starting out in the Occupy movement, and you know when she came along, it was like, whoa, there is a, a breath of fresh air and energy in this. And you know, Chicago's a big city. When we embarked on an Occupy movement, uh, we understood that it needed to be citywide. And Marissa was really one of the people who said, here's, you know, here's the way we're going to take it to the neighborhoods. And she's done that with Occupy the South Side. The thing I want to talk about a little bit is um, the Freedom School. And uh, you know, the first few times Marissa talked to me about Freedom School, I didn't quite understand what it was. But then I got down there and I saw it and I said, this is awesome. If we're going to have a movement, we've got to actually be in the business of educating people. And um, so, Marissa, will you come on up and tell folks just a little bit about what you're doing? <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, first, uh, Freedom School is 100% a us thing. Um, I have a bunch of help from uh, people like uh, Wimbush and AJ, and we've been um, going strong for a while. Right now, we're wrapping up our Freedom Summer Challenge, which has been an eight-week program that was based on the curriculum of the original Freedom Schools of Mississippi, 1964. Um, and it's very exciting work. We're bringing together families and offering them an alternative to um, CPS as a well, as a supplement to CPS. And we teach things like restorative justice, how to make your own soap, growing your own food, um, taking care of yourself. And our next semester, year two of the Washington Park Freedom School will begin October 1st of this year. And we're always looking for students of all ages and volunteers of all ages involved in the work we do. Um, if you want more information, you can see me, uh, AJ, or uh, Wimbush in the front row. And yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Marissa. Um, I'm going to very briefly now um, introduce Jenna Pope, uh, who couldn't be here today. And Jenna is a photographer who many of you are probably familiar with. Do you want to come on up to her? Yeah, no, okay. Um, but uh, Jenna is an example to me of that I'll be there spirit. I was in Madison last week and uh, was in the Capitol Rotunda and was chatting with one of my friends and he said, oh, here's somebody you need to meet. And Jenna Pope was there. And um, I just think it's appropriate that wherever there's a fight going on, uh, she's there. She's moved out to New York to take her, her work there. Um, and uh, but she's she's been back recently, and since she can't be here, I'll tell you that in the state of Wisconsin, they've now made it a crime to sing, and uh, so every day people are singing in the Capitol Rotunda, and people are arrested. So uh, all of us, I think, should put a day on our calendar to get on up to Madison to be part of that struggle, uh, and I'm sure Jenna would appreciate it. So for Jenna Pope, please.
and had a horse in her campaign and went up and down the streets with this horse. I'm like, this is a pretty cool woman. And she, uh, that was her only platform. People bought into it. You know, she did not become sheriff. And um, she then, that through that recognition, uh, the Green Party of the United States asked her to be the vice presidential candidate um, this, this past election where she went around to not just talk about Green Party, but talk about the economic injustice that we have more foreclosed homes than we do homeless, and we can't put homeless people in houses. This is what she's fighting for. This is what she's continuing on. She can't make it today. Um, she's gonna. She's on her way to Oakland for a, a conference, but we are honoring Sherry for her work with the focus. Next up is Tom Tresser. Tom. Most people in this room know a lot about Tom Tresser, um, and uh, I'll just mention a few of his recent accomplishments. Um, the No Games campaign to keep the 2016 Olympics from coming to Chicago. And Authority, teaching at Loyola School of the Art Institute, IIT, DePaul, uh, uh, Rogers Park, People's Housing, and uh, most notably, I think right now, his TIFF Illumination uh, Project, and that's part of the, um, the Civic Lab. Um, and I have just learned about the Civic Lab, but I think it's a, a tremendous, tremendous idea, again, on this um, idea that we have to do more than just protest, we have to do more than just petition, we have to educate and we have to find new truth. So, Tom, would you take a moment to tell us about the Civic Lab? Thank you, everybody. Uh, I think it's great when people come together to share, to celebrate, to commune. Uh, we don't do it enough. So, so give it up for our organizers here. You know, a lot of work to keep these things on. So the Civic Lab is a space in the West Loop for uh, co-working, uh, sharing community and collaborating around social change and civic innovation. So um, come visit us at 114 West at the North Aberdeen Street in the West Loop. We're right across the street from Oprah's studio. So maybe some of that will rub off on you. Uh, but we're about um, teaching classes uh, on all things civic, so if you'd like to teach a class, uh, there's a lot of knowledge in this room. We'd like to keep your get your knowledge into the street, so to speak, for general education classes, for adults first, and then for teens. So we're talking about how to read a budget, how to lead a meeting, how to organize a rally, Andy there. Yeah. Um, but but if you talk if you think about labor history, the struggle for civil rights, all the things that you guys know and live. Can you do 90 minutes and make it available for the general public, you know, once a month, once every other month? Um, food justice in Chicago, what's a food desert? Where is it? Well, let's learn about it, but then let's go visit a garden and maybe pick some tomatoes while you're at it. So we're talking about skills, knowledge, and experience. So come play with us at the Civic Lab. But I'd like to take two seconds, if I may, um, I think in the spirit of our collaboration and sharing, I would be remiss if I didn't put something out there for, for you, for us, to contemplate. So on the way up here, I was thinking, well, like, you know, five years straight up of civic work, nonstop, from one fight to another, what, what's the theme that I might share with you that, that we might build on or, or kick around? And I'd like to offer something up for your consideration. And that is a, a new frame, a new story that I think we should be talking about and sharing, and I, I could call it Our City. Chicago, our city. So let's play with that for a second. I offer you a few bullet points for this frame or for this story that we can embellish on and build on. The first is we are not broke. So we reject, so we reject this frame of austerity, right? We, we don't have any money. I'm sorry for you that your, your trauma center was closed. 
or your school has got too many kids in it, or what have you, or there's, there's not enough books in the library. Um, you know, we feel you, but there's no money. We reject that. There's plenty of money. Um, we want more public, not less public. We want more public education. We want more public housing. We want more public health. We want more public space, libraries, tra mass transit. So following on the, the frame, we are not broke. We reject the concept that the word public is a dirty word. Somehow, these people, and I'm talking about the mayor and his inner circle of privatizers, are strip mining the public assets and transferring our stuff into the hands and pockets of a few. So we want more public, not less public. And then I say, we, we, we will take care of ourselves. We're not going to wait for the federal government to come in here because it'll never happen. We've got too many wars going on here. So somehow, we have to use the assets and stuff that we have in Chicago, which is considerable, to take care of ourselves. And we have to do this by recirculating what we need and what we have. We have to be creative and we have to be collaborative. And I would offer one particular tool there would be a public bank for the city of Chicago. It would be a huge opportunity for us to just use the money that we have here and we can put it to good use. So let's recirculate, let's recreate, and let's collaborate. And if, I would say that we have to dream big. We have to dream big in this city of Chicago and recreate this city so that it works for everyone and not the privileged few. And you know what, finally I want to share with you after five months straight of public meetings, almost two a week, in 15 wards all over the city, the people are ready for this we're speaking about here tonight. They are ready for the change that we have been talking about for a long time, and they're ready to walk with us to 2015 when we have to make some serious changes in the city. Thank you very much. Since I have this opportunity to uh, push, uh, shall we say, the cause du jour, and uh, like so many of you, um, what I uh, did on my summer non-vacation, uh, <laughs> as I know so many of you are, are very busy as well, we're on the cusp of perhaps winning equal marriage rights in Illinois for LGBT people. 
The first time this campaign was pushed, it was pushed in a totally top-down, retrograde manner and predictably failed, even though in Illinois, those who favor this bill outnumber our opponents by nearly two to one margin. That shows you that the real power of people power is like, even when you have the polls dramatically in your favor, you don't get out on the streets and push it, really push it then the other side, the Cardinal Georges of the world, et cetera, will win. And this is important, whether or not you're LGBT, it's important whether or not you are interested in getting married, it's all about whether or not LGBT people in this state will finally become human beings entitled to citizenship, because citizenship is defined as having equal legal rights with your peers. And that's what the equal marriage rights uh, struggle is truly about. The religious right doesn't care whom I marry or any of you marry, because they don't know us. I mean, we're strangers to them, and we don't care who they marry because they're strangers to us. What they do care about is preserving the right to discriminate, the right to cast a whole group of people as the other, and, and that's what they look forward to when they think back to traditional family, and the traditional family they think of is the families of the 1950s when black could not marry white, when women were literally property of men and so forth. And so uh, we need to think about what this fight is about. It's about more than just equal marriage rights, as important as that is. And we are one of many, many organizations that are pushing for a mass march on Springfield at the start of the fall veto session on Tuesday, October 22nd. There's gonna be buses going from around the state, including, of course, here from Chicago. We really appeal to you to join us in solidarity at that. And uh, just one last message, if I may. Um, People have heard about the horrible situation in Russia for LGBTs, uh, the horrible law that just passed. Um, as we recognize the important work that Russia has done in protecting valuable whistleblowers like Snowden, we also have to remember that unfortunately Putin is acting like a total jerk towards LGBTs. And someone asked me about this contradiction uh, as I explained how Obama has been so vicious against people like Snowden and Manning. I said, well, all governments are jerks. We gotta make the change ourselves. So thank you very much. tonight, Father Jose Landaverde. Uh, Father Landaverde, please come join us up here. I feel a very close connection to Father Landaverde uh, in part because he is very close friends with people who are very close friends of mine, uh, Luis and Lauren and uh, Luis also from El Salvador, and um, uh, in that wherever there's a fight, I'll be there, spirit, the night of the NATO protests. Lauren and Luis called me and said, we have to go and find Father Landa Verde. He's, he's been hurt. And, um, and that's how I found out that this is a guy who when there's a fight, he'll be there. Um, Father Landa Verde is with Our Lady of Guadalupe Anglican Catholic Church in um, uh, Little Village, Pilsen, and um, what he has done in terms of working for the rights of all people, immigrant people, undocumented people, is so important to this city and everybody in it. Uh, he has given us hope that there will be a day when we will not remember what it was like to imagine that a person could be illegal. That they will come, but for right now, Father Landa Verde and the people that he is leading are working for rights for all people in this city that we share. Um, he 
has done something that for me is particularly important. He has made the church a center of social action here in Chicago. And I am somebody who has always believed that if we could have the example of churches that are working openly, fearlessly, and aggressively for peace and justice for all people, it could be an example to so many others. And uh, so I thank him for that. And Father Landaverde has been working just in the last few weeks on a very important campaign uh, involving justice for uh, uh, members of the immigrant community in terms of getting equal access to health care and in particular transplants. I'd like to give him an opportunity to just tell us what the very latest is on that and perhaps say a little bit more about what you've been doing. Well, uh, first of all, I, I am very humbled to be in this place, you know, because I remember um, 15 years ago when we were protesting against police brutality, when Natania Hegerty was killed by a police officer, we had the meetings up there, <laughs> you know, going up there to organize. Uh, we have been fighting at the last uh, couple weeks, basically all these years to um, for immigration rights, uh, fighting back the Homeland Security with the dream that we're not gonna, one day we're not gonna be persecuted, you know, in the state of Illinois by the police, by immigration, constantly our family separate. Beside that, for a civil right, you know, hu human right that is uh, in the state of Illinois at the national level if you are undocumented and you need a kidney transplant or liver transplant, you are dead because hospitals will tell you literally you cannot receive a um, liver transplant or kidney transplant because you don't have a documents, you don't have a social security. You will have to be just in dialysis. And, and, the, and healthcare is a human right. For regards to um, legal status or economical status, all human beings will deserve healthcare. This is why we decided a year ago to go on a hunger strike for 21 days and we took over Rush University Medical Center at 10 midnight. <laughs> and a doctor came out and said that he was in our side and he's in our side, Dr. David Ensel, and we convinced Rush University to be our partners. The next university that we took over, they didn't even know how we get in, was the Loyola uh, Medical Center in, in Maywood. Yeah. And we made them to do the same transplants. Then we went to University of Illinois. We did the same thing. We uh, stayed there. We stayed 21 days in hunger strike to convince them, them to do a round table uh, last year. But then during the year, they broke the promises then the um, August um, and sorry, July 29, we decided to go in hunger strike once again and go against a Christ Medical Center at the south side, which we uh, were almost taking over the, the hospital when uh, the administration decided to meet with us. We had uh, two people arrested there, but with the families and with, with the people need the transplant. Then uh, we went again to the uh, northwest to. Uh, UIC Medical Center and did the same thing, but we started a big fight against Northwestern Medical Center where we've been camping up there, occupying, and we, we did for two days. One was that we moved our people in front of Northwestern to speak to somebody from the administration. Then we did a march with, from Little Village, a funeral that we walked from Little Village to the hospital and we stay in front of the hospital until the administration called David Ensel, Dr. David Ensel, and asked and started a dialogue with the patients who need transplant. For all this protesting, we got, the, we got five hospitals now, committee, including a Stroyer Hospital, to begin a round table in August 27, and we're gonna push them and we're gonna fight for life until then, if you want to learn a little bit our campaign, I have uh, some flyers saying here, and and we just went with this uh, slogan that um, 
healthcare is a human right. And we were saying not just for the rich and white, but <laughs> And then we, we're going to continue this fight until then. This week also we are engaged in another campaign in, in Wheeling, Illinois. You know that the, the mayor of Wheeling has decided to tow the Holland security to a group of families who live in trailers by Milwaukee Avenue. Uh, three days ago, and we are now, uh, some people from Occupy are now in Wheeling, Illinois, taking videos and pictures what they, what they, what they are doing, and we have to continue occupying, continue this fight until the end, until we stop all human rights violations by the system. hearing a lot of things that I really love. Healthcare is a human right, and the Occupy, the occupation will continue. So thank you to all of our award winners tonight. Thank you to all of you. And now, um, uh, Pastor Schwartz from here at the Unitarian Church has some closing remarks for us. Good evening. It has been so good to be with you this evening. Thank you, AJ. Thanks to the Foundation for a United Front. I'm David Schwartz, along with my wife, Terry. I'm one of the ministers here at First Unitarian Church. I'm new to Chicago. I moved here one month ago. We started our ministry here at this church two weeks ago. So I am not familiar with your struggles but I am familiar with the struggle, this universal struggle that we are all making towards justice, towards equal rights. It's been a pleasure this evening to hear the speakers, to learn a little bit more about this good work that we're engaged in. I want to comment, and just briefly before we close, on why to hold an event like this in a religious institution at all. <laughs> Why not hold it in a community center, a restaurant, a park, for that matter? To me, and I suspect for you as well, the matter is simple, it is straightforward, it is this. My commitment to seeking justice in this world, to making justice in this world, to winning justice in this world, is born from my deepest belief of what I am alive to do. It's born from my basic understanding, the deepest root I have of what I'm here on earth for. We call that by many different names, we hold many different theologies or no theology at all to describe that feeling. But I'll say as a Unitarian Universalist, the theology doesn't nearly matter so much as the fruit that it bears here in this world. It's fitting to give these awards tonight in a church because our work for justice grows from our deepest commitments in life. Nearly a century ago, the Universalist minister, Clarence Skinner, he was a proponent of the social gospel, this idea, sort of pre-war idea, that churches should be hard at work, in his words, making the kingdom of heaven here instead of waiting for it. He wrote this, and I want to share it with you. I want to share it because there's a paradox in this work, and the paradox is we're working to do everything we can, and we are engaged in a struggle that stretches beyond our lifetime. And we do it anyway. We do it anyway. We pass it forward, hand to hand, generation to generation. This is what he wrote. He said, the fight for freedom is never won. Inherited liberty is not liberty, but tradition. Each generation must win for itself 
the right to emancipate itself from its own tyrannies, which are ever unprecedented and peculiar. Therefore, those who have been reared in freedom bear a tremendous responsibility to the world to win an ever larger and more important liberty. It is easy, he said, to gain the right to palliate when charity is popular. It is easy, he said, to hide slavery behind the mask of relief. But it is hard to win the freedom to eradicate, to blaze the trail, to risk prestige, popularity, ease, in a fight against the causes of misery. You gathered here are doing just that. You are blazing the trail, risking prestige, popularity, and ease in a fight against the causes of misery. That fight sometimes is toil and drudgery. That fight sometimes is joyful celebration. That fight is always holy work. Thank you all, and go in peace. That is the award show, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out. Uh, thank you for being here. one thing from you guys. Brag about this. <laughs> we want to make this the awards event for activists and community organizers because there is no there is no recognition for us. Continue on what you're doing. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>